Welcome to the Face to Face Ministries podcast. I'm Kathy Little. And I'm Melinda Wilson. And we are talking all things inner healing, true connection with Jesus, and the full benefits package of the cross. Thank you for joining us. Welcome to episode 37. Yes, episode 37. You know, we just released four podcasts in what we would call a quick release format because we were traveling and it was easier to just do our part and the interview all in one stop. And so we did that with the past four episodes, but we're back to our normal format now because we are back home in California and beginning to sift through all of the amazing content that we got while we were on the East Coast. And actually, this interview that we are releasing today is with the first person we interviewed on that trip. Yes, it is incredibly gifted, talented Judith McNutt of Christian Healing Ministries in Jacksonville, Florida. This woman is a woman of dignity and grace and great humor. It was truly an honor to be with her. It felt like being in the presence of a giant in the faith, but also she's really tall, I got to say. I think she's about (laughs) 5'11". Anyway, um, (laughs) but she just has a presence about her, a kindness, a gentleness, a love. You feel loved just being with her in the room. And I felt like I wanted to sit at her feet and learn because of her years and years of experience and probably a lot of trial and error. But as she will share, she is the wife of Francis McNutt. And many of you have probably heard of him. He's really a pioneer in the healing movement back in the 60s and 70s, has written several books. Yeah, as you're talking about pioneers, you know, um, Francis McNutt is 94. And uh, as you think of the inner healing movement, there's actually three different names that kind of rise to the top of kind of the grandparents. It would be John and Paula Sanford who started Elijah House, and they are no longer living, but we did interview the current director of that ministry, Rochelle Holbin, a few episodes back. And then Agnes Sanford is another one who was very much a pioneer. And no relation to John and Paula. No relation at all. One has a D and one doesn't Mm -hmm. in Sanford. And then Francis and Judith McNutt. Mm -hmm. And so what an incredible honor we had to sit with this grandmother of the inner healing movement. I, I mean, it was just simply amazing. And, you know, we only asked to speak to Judith because we presumed that Francis would not have been able to come. And then we found out he almost did. And (laughs) man, it was like almost to be able to talk to Francis McNutt as well. But we are truly honored to introduce you today to Judith McNutt. This is part one. Please subscribe so you don't miss part two. It is so worth it. It's just the interview was a little long and we don't want to do them all in a big, big chunk that's too much to digest at once. But this is part one with Judith McNutt. Although I got to say, I don't feel like the interview was long. It was long for <laughs> one podcast, but it was not long enough because like I said, I could have just yeah, we sat and talked, talked to her for forever. hours and hours. It was hard to wrap it up actually, because she's a wealth of wisdom and experience. And again, just dignity. If you get a chance that she actually has a lot of teachings on YouTube, if you just Google Judith McNutt and she's got several teachings and she is a wonderful teacher, very engaging. So yeah, but here is part one. Part one. Take it away. Judith McNutt. We are here today (laughs) with Judith McNutt and we are so honored Thank More you. than honored. If there was a word that was stronger than honored, we would say that's, that that's to enough. be with you <laughs> today. <laughs> She's humble. Thank you. But Judith, would you just explain and share with us who you are mm. and what you do for those of you, those of us who have not uh, are not familiar with what you do and who you are? Oh, sure, sure. I'd be happy to. Well, my name is Judith McNutt. I'm president of Christian Healing Ministries, which is where we are right now in Jacksonville, Florida. We came, we came here in 1987, we being my husband and me. We married in 1980. I met him in Jerusalem in 1975, and we married five years later and started Christian Healing Ministries. 
And then we moved here in 1987 and established uh, Christian Healing Ministries here in Jacksonville. Um, I'm a psychotherapist by profession, licensed in the state of Florida, and I've worked in psychiatric hospitals um, in the Boston area and in Kentucky, where I'm from originally. And I got involved in healing prayer, really when I was working in Boston at the psychiatric hospital, because uh, although I love psychology, and I think it's a wonderful tool, diagnostically, mm -hmm. it didn't bring healing to people. Mm. And after seeing the amount of suffering that people were going through, and even people in the church where I grew up, I started praying and asking the Lord, what do you want me to do? What, mm. what can be done for these people? And that's when he gave me uh, Isaiah 61 and uh, said, that's what I want to do. I want to heal the brokenhearted. I want to set the captive free, you know, open prison doors. And I said, well, what can I do? And he said, pray. Hmm. He said, bring them to me and I'll heal them. I created them. I love them. I can heal them. Hmm. So I started praying with my patients in about 1972. And I saw miracles. Mm. And before that, uh, I mean, the hospitals I worked in were excellent, and people received excellent care, but and medication and all kinds of therapies. But they would come back, or they'd go mm. to another hospital, and it's like they would kind of get refueled or recharged mm -hmm. or encouraged, and they'd go out and have the same issues, because they're going back into the same situation. Sure. Bad family, whatever. So I started praying, and I, I stayed another year at that hospital. And that's kind of a fun story, too, because I basically got in trouble, because I was praying, not with <laughs> people, uh, but the head psychologist called me in, and he said, what are you doing? He said, your patients are getting well. And I was like, oh, gosh, you know, my mother had prayed me into that job. <laughs> <laughs> so when I told him I was praying for my patients, uh, he, he really just overreacted and said, you can't do that here. Mm. You know, it's a clinical setting. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And these people are confused. And I said, well, I'm not even talking to them about God. Mm. I'm just praying. And uh, he said, well, you can't do that here. So... Who do you listen to, God or your boss? <laughs> you know, so. <laughs> so I kept praying, and people kept getting well. But after a time, I had been in Israel for one summer and just fell in love with the people and the place. Mm. And I ended up moving back there and opening a house of prayer mm. uh, where I could just pray openly with people and do Bible studies. And uh, so I lived there for three years. Wow. And that's where I met my husband. Okay. So. So let's uh, talk about your husband. And many people have heard of Francis McNutt. Many people haven't. But um, tell me how you met in Israel. Yes. And was this a love at first sight thing? Or how did you know that he was the one? Did you Were you looking to be married? Well, I wasn't. No, no. I uh, I was very career oriented, and mm -hmm. when I got to Jerusalem, I just opened this house of prayer, and that was I was living and breathing that. Mm -hmm. You know, we'd open it like eight in the morning and close it two in the morning. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we were in our twenties, you know. Uh, another a friend of mine, who's still my very dear friend, moved there with me, mm -hmm. and we opened it. We were like sisters. Mm -hmm. We still are, and. Uh, no, I wasn't looking to marry. I think I had uh, done enough marriage counseling mm. <laughs> that I was a little afraid of it, to be honest. Uh, not terribly afraid, but a little bit. Uh, but then then he came, and was it love at first sight? It was something at first sight, mm. yes. It was definitely... Spirit connect. I had stopped dating. I dated a lot uh, because I was, you know, by that time... Um, 27, I guess. And there, yeah, when I saw him, there was this uh, huge attraction and wanted to get to know him, of course. And But 
there was five to 8,000 people in the conference there, so the odds were not great to meet him. <laughs> so I went to hear him lecture one night in the old city of Jerusalem while he was still in town. And as God would have it, uh, my spiritual director introduced me to Francis. Mm. And then he sent me to Staten Island, New York for a five-day training. Because at this time, I was praying with my pastor for people all over Israel. Mm. And he thought I needed more training. Mm -hmm. And he had read Francis's first book, Healing, which is just such a classic. And he said, you know, you need to go and be trained in this by someone that I know and trust. So I went to Staten Island, New York, went through five days of training, and uh, we reconnected again. Mm. And then I ended up moving to Clearwater, Florida for a season, uh, not knowing that that's where Francis came to to write his books. And I volunteered at this, it was a large community called Spirit of God. It was a Catholic charismatic group. And he would come there and speak and then stay at this facility and write his books. So we read into each other again. And we started to question at that point, maybe God has <laughs> is, is tried to tell us something. And I think we married a year later. We started a discernment process. And of course, he was uh, one of the five, five top preachers in the Roman Catholic Church. Oh, okay. And well known around the world. Mm -hmm. uh, so when we married, the invitations started coming in from all the denominations. He was always. I remember the first time I heard him speak in Jerusalem at this conference on the Holy Spirit. I looked at my friend and I said, this man is gifted to bring healing to the body of Christ. Mm -hmm. I'll never forget that moment because he was known for being anointed for healing, mm -hmm. you know, and physical healing, and he'd written a book on how to do it. But I felt like his uh, one of his great gifts was so much larger than that. So after we married, we started speaking in all denominations mm -hmm. around the world. And uh, he's he's very well loved and respected because of his uh, ba the balance, theological balance that he brings, the integrity to the healing ministry. So was he more focused, he was more focused on the physical healing, is that, or well, it's interesting because he, he started out, if you hear, hear his testimony, um, during, during times of trying to help Christians in counseling, you know, pastoral counseling, he started out just having such a heart for people that were broken. And then he, he went to a CFO mm. up in Tennessee at the invitation of a woman that he had been in a dinner meeting with and she was talking about all the physical healings that she mm. had seen. And so she scholarshiped him. And he went to that conference, that CFO, and it was Derek Prince oh, wow. and Agnes Sanford mm -hmm. and Tommy Tyson. Mm. And they all took him under wing. I mean, they were all just very uh, interested in him and what he was doing. So at that time, he learned more about physical healing. And then he learned about deliverance and spiritual healing. So when he wrote the book Healing in 1974, he included the, what we call the four kinds of healing. Mm. So he, he always had this kind of you know broader picture of healing. Mm -hmm. Like where I grew up in eastern Kentucky, we had a lot of uh, Assembly of God, Pentecostal uh, people come through and they'd pitch a tent on the edge of town. And my mother, we were at a church that didn't believe in healing. They didn't actually preach against it, but they didn't encourage it either. And she, I was a little girl and she would take me to these meetings. And I would see people falling over and mm -hmm. praying in tongues and all these different things. And I thought, what are they doing? And <laughs> you know, who are they? And, but my mother prayed for healing in her home. She had an active mm. ministry in her home, and people were healed of cancer, and marriages mm. healed. And I kind of grew up watching her do all mm -hmm. that. 
So when Francis and I married, it was such a, a, a wonderful union in so many ways. But we both had this larger picture because so many people in the healing ministry, well, take Earl Roberts, you know, Earl was physical healing, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know, and he knew he was gifted for that. Mm -hmm. uh, so our whole ministry, we've been together 40 years now, uh, has been to try and bring that larger picture of healing and bring a lot of balance of psychological and theological to the whole ministry of healing. So really you coming together brought, there was, it sounds like there was a lot of synergy because he was more focused on physical healing, but you were more from the, what would you, what did you even call it back then? Did you call it inner healing or spiritual healing? What was the name for it? Well, the it? interesting thing is Agnes Sanford really coined healing of memories. Okay. She was the first one to really talk about this, and she she mentored Francis. Mm -hmm. She was very key in his life. Uh, she called him her boy. <laughs> <laughs> she was older. Um, so inner healing uh, became it became inner healing through Francis. He coined that term. Oh. Because what we kept running into, or he kept running into was uh, people that were older that were having memory issues would come up and say, I need that healing of memories. I can't remember anything anymore. And he thought, that's not a very good term. So he's the one that called it inner healing. And that just talks more about what, you know, Paul talked about the inner man. Mm -hmm. uh, but then some people, and sometimes we'll use this term, call it emotional healing. Mm -hmm. You know, so... There's all kinds of reactions, unfortunately, against the different names because of people's lack of understanding mm -hmm. about what we're doing. Were there other people that were doing this inner healing, heart healing, healing of the memories? You said Agnes Sanford. Were there other contemporaries? Did you know John and Paula Sanford? Oh, or? they were dear friends, yes. They were dear friends. Yes, okay. yes. Yeah, they were, they were active. Francis, I remember the year before we married uh, in 1979, he did a conference in Hawaii with uh, John and Paula and met them then. And I think they, yeah, they were friends. And then they came here a few times and they were in our home. They're wonderful people. And we've worked with Laura and their son and mm -hmm. different people. So I would say they were early pioneers, absolutely. Mm -hmm. uh, and Agnes did a lot of training mm -hmm. with them, training them. You know, she was kind of like the mother, I think, of many of the early pioneers. When you and Francis got married, did you, was it, did you know that you were kind of bringing two ministries together and now it was a more holistic approach? You said that you had a, explain what you mean by you had a bigger vision because Francis was doing healing and obviously you were doing more of the heart healing, but what mm -hmm. was the bigger vision that came about when you guys got married and came together in ministry? What did that look like? I, well, I believe uh, I was definitely being a, a psychotherapist focused more on, on heart healing. Even though I had grown up in a home where I saw physical healing, mm -hmm. I experienced two real miracles growing up through my mother praying for me, uh, physical healing. Mm. Uh, where one, I was hit by a car and they said I wouldn't live. So I was very comfortable with physical healing. So when I met him, uh, he kind of put the piece of deliverance in there for me too. Mm. Uh, I didn't have, uh, even though I, I remember specifically in the hospital where I worked, I s saw people that I felt it was something more than psychosis or neurosis, that there was something evil that had attached to them, but I didn't understand it very well. And then when I lived in Israel, uh, I was trained by my pastor and another pastor from Pretoria, South Africa, who came and stayed with us for a while, uh, trained us in deliverance ministry. And Francis, of course, talks about spiritual healing. And it, for me, he put together those four kinds of healing. I always knew there was more because I didn't see people as just bones and disease yeah. and things. And I, I knew there was psychogenic uh, roots of some mm -hmm. people's illnesses, uh, their physical illness. So he kind of pulled all that together. 
I, I think I was, I've always been very, uh, growing up, very evangelical. Mm-hmm. And the reason I moved to Israel was as a missionary. You know, so I, I have a heart for bringing people to the Lord, too. And, of course, he had that, but he was more focused on Christians getting well. Mm-hmm. And I just kind of had that broader picture. I wanted mm-hmm. everyone. Mm-hmm. And I'm sure he did, too. But he was, as a priest, focused on yeah. Christians and getting them healed and trained. And yeah, Can you share with us what the cross-section is? Because you are a therapist, a, mm-hmm. a psychotherapist. Share with us what that looked like when you kind of brought those two together and if you wouldn't mind share a little bit about how they can be used together and I could ask like four questions in one I don't want to do that so let's just start from there of how can traditional counseling or psychotherapy be used with inner healing prayer well it's really the ideal space to use inner healing prayer also pastoral counseling is Mm -hmm. uh, confession Uh, Because basically you have someone that's coming in and you're listening to their life story or to their problems. And hopefully you're listening to the Lord Mm -hmm. is what we train our prayer ministers here. Getting those words of knowledge or discernment. Uh, And then we we stop short of the actual prayer. Mm. And I think that was, as, as a young person, that was my frustration in the church that I grew up in. And that my mother was very responsible to get me to church every time the doors opened you know, <laughs> and memorize the Bible and everything. But the, the power of God, the power of prayer, what that can do, it's the ideal situation in counseling. It's just the ideal. Mm-hmm. Once you hear it, uh, and like here, for instance, we have, say, a 90-minute prayer appointment. And... The hardest thing is to get is to get someone to stop talking about their problems, mm-hmm. you know. Mm-hmm. So we have to actually trade our prayer ministers. You don't know, give them a certain amount of time mm-hmm. to talk because people. It's so tragic because people are not listened to mm-hmm. in this world. Mm-hmm. When they come here for prayer, they've got someone that cares. They're loving. They're anointed, mm-hmm. and they want to keep talking. They just want to get their whole story out. Yeah. And maybe they don't have the value placed on prayer that should be there or God's intervention or God's power. And I think that's what I'd love to see counselors and therapists and priests and clergy all understand because we're not really called to to fix people. And we keep falling back into that Mm -hmm. trap. We're really meant to just love them where they are and bring them to God. And let God do the healing. And um, with our profound sense of control and, and need to fix people, we have a hard time doing that. Yeah, yeah. And counselors especially have a hard time mm-hmm. doing that. And, and pastors. Pastors um, really aren't trained in pastoral counseling when you mm-hmm. get right down to it. And they're trained to preach and teach. And they have to do, I feel sorry for pastors because they have to, do everything. Do everything. <laughs> and yeah, and so now you're expecting them to fix marriages and people have, they have a dying child. You're supposed to go in and bring comfort, but what about the healing prayer? You know, so we have a lot of clergy that come here to learn, to be healed, but also to bring healing. Mm-hmm. Uh, how do I do that? How do I sit with someone that's suffering and bring healing to them and, and get out of the way? Yeah. If God has said anything to me over the course of my lifetime, it has been get out of my way. <laughs> he just he says that to me all the time because even the therapists in me will start to tune in and want to fix them, right? Or give them good advice. Yeah. Like our 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 saying here, and we have it on all of our shirts, mugs, everything. <laughs> here it is. Listen, Listen, love, and pray. Listen is the first word. <laughs> yes, and it's it's so hard because they, even our prayer ministers, and we laugh about this with them, they still want to give advice. Yeah. They're such advice givers. Yeah. And in Isaiah 61, he said, I've come to bring good news, 
not good advice. <laughs> and I tell them that all the time. <laughs> good news. What's the good news? I heal the brokenhearted. I set the captive free. I open prison doors. I make you like an oak of righteousness. Mm. You know, that's the Lord. Yeah. So I'd love to see. We used to have an annual conference for uh, psychiatrists and psychologists and counselors. And I think it's time to resurrect that again because mm. uh, it's tough. They burn out. They don't know really how to how to bring lasting victory in a person's life. I would love to hear how Christian Healing Ministries came about and following from that, just I'm saying it so I'll remember what your method of prayer or methodology of prayer looks like. But first, how did CHM, Christian Healing Ministries, come about? Well, it was basically when we married, um, you know, we were traveling and speaking and people kept asking us, can I come to you for prayer? Can I come to you for prayer? Because mm. we were doing conferences and speaking in churches. And mm. uh, we said, well, we don't have a place. Mm. You know, basically, I had a private practice called Christian Counseling Services when my husband and I married. Okay. So I did have the office spaces. Mm -hmm. And I had other therapists with me. It was at like a clinic. Uh, so we said, well, maybe we should, you know, do a nonprofit and have it to where people can come and get prayer. So we started doing that in 80, um, 1980, and then it started growing. And we hadn't planned on that, you know, but there's so many hurting people. Yeah. And they'd hear us speak or read his books. Mm -hmm. They were so popular. Um, so they would call and make appointments. So we had to start getting more people to come in and help because we were traveling. So then we said, Lord, what do you want us to do? And we really felt that he wanted to start a healing center mm. um, until the church is doing what it should be doing. <laughs> and so when that word went out, we had invitations from all over America. Mm. Uh, people wanted us to come into their area and start it. So we had a tremendous interest. And when we prayed about it, you know, we just kind of put all the places down and we prayed about it and Jacksonville emerged. Mm. Um, but they had a very uh, wonderful Episcopal bishop here, uh, Bishop Frank Servanet and his wife, Emmy. And they came down a few times and they had uh, a priest here another named Father Frank Deering who had really spearheaded the healing ministry in this diocese. And he was getting older, and he heard that we were going to relocate. So he said, you've got to go down and get them here. So they got a whole core group of people here really serious about it and praying. And they said, you know, we will come, we will help if you'll come here and do this. And so the Lord directed us here. So that, that's how we ended up in Jacksonville. And we did have... Uh, Tremendous uh, support, not financial as much, but tremendous support from people who believed in healing and wanted to be a part mm -hmm. of it. So it's just grown since then. Did you already have a, we're kind of calling them inner healing models, for lack of a better word. If you have a better word, please let me know. Okay. Um, <laughs> but I love that inner healing was coined by Francis. I didn't know that. Mm -hmm. I just heard it all my life, but that's great. Did you already have like a kind of model? Obviously, it's not just praying for people random, like bless her Lord in Jesus name. Yeah. Uh, How did the model get developed or did you already have it when you started Christian Healing Ministries as far as this is how we pray? We have this 90 minute session. Did, how, how did that all come about? It really developed over time. In his book, Healing, he has, you know, what inner healing is and uh, how to pray, uh, the need for it, mm -hmm. certainly. He lays that out very clearly. Uh, but to actually sit down with someone at an appointment, uh, we didn't have that. So I'm, I modeled it basically uh, along the lines of what I'd learned as a therapist. Mm. You know, you, you listen to someone's story. Mm -hmm. um, so the first phase is listening. And then the second one is, what's the diagnosis? Mm -hmm. You know, you're sitting with someone. Is this someone who needs uh, medication? Is this someone uh, who's 
delusional. Mm-hmm. I mean, you know, you I just started, uh, you know, when you go to a doctor, hopefully they listen to you. I mean, it's getting shorter and shorter <laughs> with insurance, but they listen to you and, you know, where's your pain? Mm-hmm. You know, how long have you had it? Um, kind of basic questions that I incorporated into the model of inner healing. Mm. And then what's the diagnosis uh, or prognosis? Mm. You know, and then what's the prayer? So how are you going to pray for this person? You've heard their story. So that's the part that's usually left off. So how are we going to pray? And then we started developing and kind of pulling together all the ways that we pray. Because it's not just an inner healing prayer, Mm -hmm. um, which it involves forgiveness and breaking of judgments and vows and soul ties. I mean, there's so many things in an inner healing prayer. And it's rarely ever just inner healing. It it usually incorporates the four kinds of healing. Mm. There can be generational issues, too. Mm -hmm. Uh, Most of the things that I've struggled with in my life has come through the generations. Mm-hmm. Um, and my father struggled with them before me and probably his father before him or mother. You know, so we, we hadn't looked at that. For so. so it's been uh, listening to the Holy Spirit and it just incorporating more and more. And then we get pieces now from other great ministries that are out there mm-hmm. that we admire and respect. Uh, in trauma, mm-hmm. like Dr. Carl Lehman and mm-hmm. others. But I'd say it really developed over time. So would you say you have a specific model, a Christian healing ministry, like you have Sozo, you have the Emmanuel Approach, you have Heart Sync. These are very specific models that kind of really adhere to certain steps. And this is Heart Sync, and that's Heart Sync. They don't you know, yeah. bring other things into it. Same with Emmanuel, same with Sozo. Would that now you said that you have kind of adopted and learned, so yours sounds a little bit more breathable, I guess, so to speak. Um, it's very breathable. So, <laughs> is would you find it's a good word. you feel like it's more organic, but you still have kind of boundary way of doing it? We really uh, probably should with this ministry move away from model mm-hmm. uh, because we don't have a model okay. uh, to speak of like they do. Mm-hmm. Um, I have great respect for all those ministries, and, and they're my friends, all of them. But they have more structure mm-hmm. uh, than we do. What we try to do is educate people about humans mm. and about God mm. uh, and about life, you know, and the things that have happened to people and kind of broaden their thinking. When I was growing up, it was, it was all... Uh, sin focused you know everything was you know what have you done that's sinful and you need to come forward and yeah i love what dallas willard said he said it's sin management Mm -hmm. was what most Mm -hmm. of us grew up with but i know people that don't sin uh but they're just damaged Mm -hmm. you know and it's either generational or it's a cult activity that could have come into their life some way um so the interest that really, if you interviewed our prayer ministers, they would probably say, aside from giving advice, which we are always on top of that, don't give advice. You know, the thing they would say would be the hardest would be there's not that structure mm-hmm. of how to do things. And we challenge them to hear God, mm-hmm. to be led by the Holy Spirit. And... We rely heavily on the gifts of the Holy Spirit and discernment and a word of knowledge Mm -hmm. and wisdom, uh, the gifts of healing, all of that. And I I think that uh, probably would be the greatest challenge for anyone. So we teach on intimacy with God, knowing God. Uh, My sheep hear my voice and they follow me. How do you hear the voice of God? And we think about it in terms of uh, direction for my life, but how do you hear God for someone else? So we teach them how to hear God Mm -hmm. and how to follow the Holy Spirit. And they're excellent at it now. 
Uh, they, they've passed me up. They've passed Francis up. I mean, some of our prayer ministers, they, they see things and they hear, you know, and they're able to see. Like Sue's husband was praying one time. He's one of our great prayer ministers. And he, he saw a tricycle. Hmm. And he said, does this mean anything to you? You know, and he felt silly asking because mm-hmm. mm-hmm. it was a grown man that he was praying with. It turned out that was a key element mm-hmm. of that man's healing. Mm-hmm. So, uh, and we tell them, if you don't know how to pray, pray in the Spirit. Mm-hmm. You know, don't go down a road that God's not taking you down mm-hmm. with that person. So I think that's that's the biggest challenge is to hear God. Yeah. And then for that person and then pray in line with the Holy Spirit. Do you come up against any resistance? I mean, just in, as a gener- as your ministry, do you come up against resistance from the church? I usually it's the church that comes up against the church. It, yes, <laughs> generally speaking, because yes. the world probably doesn't care. Um, they don't. But no. have you come up against any resistance from just across uh, through the years? From like, what are you doing? You guys are crazy, <laughs> or whatever they may think you are. I know. We have had very little resistance over the years. Um, Francis and I have always really remarked on that, and I think it's because their greatest emphasis is on love. Mm. And uh, I always, we tell people, if you can't do anything else, love the person. You know, just pray for that Romans 5, 5 prayer, you know, where God pours the love into our hearts, his own love into Mm -hmm. our hearts for other people. Uh, Because I think if you love someone, with God's love and then your own, they're going to be healed one way or another. So the the biggest resistance I think we, we had, if there, I remember being on a television program one time and this man was kind of coming at us and it, it would probably be on our lack of, what can I say, um, not focusing enough on sin. You know, oh, yeah, but we do. I mean, you know, we're we're very clear on scripture. I mean, we use the Bible as the word of God, and we believe, you know, thou shalt not, and <laughs> you know, and if somebody's in that, you know, show show it to them, mm-hmm. but let the Holy Spirit convict them. I grew up, again. I grew up in a church that I felt was very loving on the one hand, but very manipulative on the other hand. I mean, <laughs> one of my favorite stories is. Uh, my pastor, he, he really, really talked a lot about hell, you know, eternal, your eternity in hell. And he would, he'd get real fiery, you know, he's in heaven, so I can tell this story. He'd get real fiery, you know, and when I was eight years old, or maybe six, I was young, he preached on adultery. And it was so frightening mm. that... <laughs> At the end of the service, they sang just as I am and offered to let people come up, you know, and I went up. <laughs> I, you know, I was I, I was convinced I had committed adultery, you know, and I went up and <laughs> it was hysterical. He said, he said, why are you up here? And I said, well, I, I did that thing you were talking about. And he was <laughs> like, what thing? And I said, I, I can't remember the word. <laughs> I said, you know, I was so little, I couldn't yeah. remember the word. And he said, you committed adultery? And I said, I must have, because I felt so guilty, Yeah, you know? So he called my mother up and said, take her home and tell her what that is. And she never did, because, no. you know, your mother never talked about adultery or sex, you know, so I didn't know <laughs> anything. But I just think, if there's any resistance, I, I've moved so far away from manipulating, and I think the more we trust the Holy Spirit, as we pray with people, the Holy Spirit convicts people. Yeah, that's his, that's yeah. one of his main roles. Sure, if they're connecting with Jesus, the yeah. Holy Spirit. I mean, that's they're going to hear. That's what we find in doing ministry is that you know we don't even need to say much. Oh, I I think I need to forgive my brother. Like, mm-hmm. yes, yes, <laughs> you know, yeah. We don't uh, even need to say. Do you think you need to forgive your brother? Or no. it just comes. It as comes they're connecting with Jesus, and it's it's his. It's goodness, it's his kindness that leads to repentance. It so is. when they do really connect with Jesus, yeah. it's the heart of Jesus that's causing them to do it. Not that's like, it's his you need to do this. Yeah, yeah. And, and they want to. And it's, it comes out of this gentle place. 
It does. Instead of this. I know. And it's beautiful. It's beautiful. And it's, and it's from the heart. Then. Yes. Yes. Like the Bible says to, to repent from your heart. Yes. And I think so much repentance is that guilt that's put on us. And then we repent. Mm-hmm. But then there's no healing afterwards. Mm-hmm. You know. It's one of the things we talk about here uh, is what we call the wounds of sin. Because so many people confess sin. Uh, because they want to do what's right. The average Christian, I mm-hmm. think, really wants to do what's right. Uh, but then they don't go through the inner healing of the, the wounds of sin. Mm-hmm. So people are left wounded and they think, well, I've not really confessed this maybe, or maybe I wasn't sincere. And then they get scrupulous and, you know, mm-hmm. obsessed with it and no peace. So when they have the, the inner healing and the spiritual healing, they know they're forgiven. And then they're healed too. Well, I have a sneaking suspicion that you as our audience can now catch a glimpse of the grace and beauty of this grandmother in inner healing, Judith McNutt. She is absolutely precious and what a wealth of wisdom. And, you know, she began sharing her story and her history as a psychotherapist, which I was not aware of that that's where she had started and then began to introduce prayer because people weren't really getting healthy and healed. And, and you know, we just interviewed Lisa Roich and Deanne Sweeney in our last podcast, episode 36. And they also talked about how when you introduce that inner healing prayer, it, it's kind of the tipping point for people. It's, it's the tipping point for people when you introduce Jesus into their trauma and their pain and not just attack it from a a traditional model, but to introduce Jesus and, and just to hear the stories of how things were changing for her clients. And it really is a great marriage made between yes, traditional therapy, where you're listening, you're hearing their story, you're validating their story, but you're not leaving them with their story or even throwing medication at their story, but you're inviting Jesus into their story and he can change, change the whole scene. Well, it reminds me of Dr. Carl Lehman, who was way back, y'all, if you haven't listened to Dr. Carl Lehman talking about the manual approach, you need to seriously. Episodes 13 and 14. Yeah, he's a Christian psychiatrist, and it's very similar in coming from a more therapeutic standpoint and then discovering that when he helped people connect, his patients connect with Jesus, the healing was a lot more expedited and deep and powerful and of course lasting and no medication needed. So, um, there's a lot of a cross, not crossover, but there's just, you see Jesus showing these experts in their field of medicine and science that when he gets connected with the people they're ministering to, the healing is that much more profound. Yes. And you know, the Isaiah 61 mandate that really is coming up as a common theme that drives all of these people in inner healing, all these inner healing models and practitioners. And it's what drives us as a ministry. You know, Jesus came to heal the brokenhearted and set the captives free. And there's such an amazing privilege and honor that we have to walk with people through their, with their journey of healing even in what we're doing in our day to day, we run a ministry. The podcast is not the only thing that we do. And we are meeting with clients via Zoom with inner healing prayer and, and doing the Emmanuel approach as a prayer model with clients that we're just meeting on Zoom and they're from all over. I feel every time I step away from an inner healing prayer appointment and just reflect on what Jesus did and, and watch him do what only he can do it absolutely brings, brings passion. It's just my passion. And this is what we're created to do and to partner with Jesus and, and hearing Judith and understanding the decades that inner healing has been growing and resurging in the church. And to be part of that Isaiah 61 mandate, it's, it's amazing. I was so kind of, I guess, tickled. I don't know if that's the right word to discover or hear from Judith that inner healing was coined by her husband, Francis, 
because I've been using that term for as long as I've ever heard of even the Sanfords, even as a child. I think I've mentioned this before that their books were in our bookshelves as a child. Of course, I had no grasp on what the heck inner healing is, but you know, that it was used to be healing of the memories and someone came and asked, can I'm, I'm being forgetful. Can you help heal that? And it had really had nothing to do with that. Um, however, you know what? Jesus would do that too. Uh, even though that's not what it meant specifically healing of the memories really had nothing to do with healing my memory. Like I forgot where my keys are, but he also can do that because why not heal all of us, the brain, the memory, the heart and inner healing is just asking Jesus for his perspective on a painful or traumatic experience that we've had in our lives that probably gives a slanted perspective on life as an adult. Well, yeah, just at the end of part one, when Judith said that, you know, many people confess sin because they want to do what's right, but they don't actually get healed from the wounds of sin. And uh, that's a real interesting thing. You know, we are left wounded and then we are still hooked by things that like we've talked about trauma where bad things have happened or we didn't get things that we should have had, or there's lies that we believe, vows we've made, judgments we've made, things that, you know, we want to do the right thing. And so we confess all of our sin, but then there are wounds of sin that she was talking about. And that's where inner healing comes into play. It's a more holistic approach. It's healing all of it. It's not just leaving bits and pieces to our own devices. It's it's a holistic healing. Like the word sozo that is used in the New Testament over a hundred times, this is what Jesus did. He saved, healed, and delivered. It's a beautiful thing. Yeah. Thank you so much for listening. Please check back next week as we have part two with this incredible woman. Again, if you met her, you would not want to leave her presence. <laughs> she would be like, stop, stop, stop. If you, you know, if she heard you say that or heard me saying that, but well, she may, she, yeah, she'll, she'll listen to this. And- yeah. But I, and I don't want to sound like I'm gushing. It's more of a real giving honor due to someone that is worthy of being honored for yeah. pioneering, um, and, and, and carrying on a legacy. And that's what she's really doing is leaving a legacy for many thousands of people, not only who have been recipients of um, this model that Francis and Judith created, but of her love for people and her teachings. So I want to just honor Judith McNutt and Francis McNutt yes. for and what they We say they thank have. you to yeah. them. We thank them. They've made a, a massive impact on the world and yes. will continue because they're training many, many other people as well. Yeah. So please, whatever platform you are listening to this podcast on, we would really love it if you would hit that subscribe button because uh, we we would love to have you aware of when all the new stuff comes out, which uh, we're trying to do that every week. We have so much content, months of content just waiting to be released. And so we'd love for you to subscribe and please give us a five-star rating. We we feel like it's worth it. I mean, come on, this is gold content here. And uh, thank and you to those that yes, have thank you given to those who have done that. And um, we're getting some more reviews in. We'd love to have your review. If you would go to Apple Podcasts and uh, give us a review, we'd love to hear from you. And you know, we love feedback because it's just the two of us here having a conversation and sharing with you this content. And we'd really love to hear how it's impacting you because there may be uh, some things that are coming up that are helpful to you, things that you're learning, maybe things you didn't know before. We'd love to hear your feedback. So please drop us a line face to face men on Instagram, face to face ministries on Facebook. And uh, you can find us at face to face ministries.org on the internet. And Hey, you know, we would love to have you partner with us. We've just made some changes on our website, on our give page to really simplify that giving process where you can go to face to face ministries.org forward slash give. And there is a form right there. You could set up to be part of our monthly grow team right there on our website. You can do that via credit card and set that up to be an automatic thing. There's several other ways that you can give and how you can get involved and be part of what we're doing to get the word out about 
the holistic inner healing work of Jesus and that Isaiah 61 mandate that we are carrying out. So we would really love to have you partner with us there. And uh, if you have any questions or anything, feel free to email us or private message us through the social channels. We'd really love to have you guys join us and be part of this. And again, this is just part one. We're just whetting your appetite. There is so much more. And part two, wow, she answered some really amazing questions uh, that we just cannot wait to share that. And Mm. that will come out uh, one week from today. So uh, please subscribe so you catch that. And we will be back with you soon. Thank you. We'll talk to you soon. Thanks so much for listening. Really, we will talk to you soon. Yes. Talk to us too. Thanks. (laughs) Thanks for listening.